So we're going to cover a little bit about the actor model and Akka.net. We're going to talk about why this matters, why it should matter to you as a developer, how it differs from maybe standard object-oriented programming. We're going to talk about the reactive manifesto and what it stands for, why it would be helpful for you to have your modern applications adhere to that manifesto. We'll give you a little history and an overview of Akka.net and the actor model. Um, we'll do the concepts and benefits of the actor model. And of course, everyone's favorite part, we'll do some demos and see this framework in action. And hopefully my goal is that you'll leave here understanding uh, a few of the key concepts, how you might get started with the framework, and uh, hopefully get you excited about some of the possibilities that are in store for us as developers. So before we get started, I always have to do a few um, acknowledgements, particularly on this presentation of mine. Uh, the first is for Roger uh, Johansson. Um, Roger's information is up there. He works for a company called NetHouse. Um, Roger, if you see any images in this presentation that look really nice and they seem kind of snazzy and like they explain a concept really well, that's 100% Roger. Um, those, those images are fantastic and I really couldn't find a way to come up with a better way to explain things and he graciously lets me use them in this presentation. So big thanks to Roger. Um, he's also one of the key contributors and uh, founders of the Akka.net um, project, so definitely follow him for some updates. Um, he's also worked on a, working on a new project similar to Akka.net called ProtoActor, which is the actor model across C Sharp and Go. Um, so some great interoperability stuff there as well. Uh, the second group of folks I uh, always like to thank is uh, the, the folks at Petabridge. Uh, Petabridge um, started by uh, Aaron Stoddard, one of the, the founders again of the, the Akka.net project. Petabridge is a consultancy firm. They do all sorts of training and implementation help around Akka.net. They also have a fantastic boot camp. So if you're interested and, and I, I somehow managed to inspire you about this framework today, um, feel free to go there and sign up for their boot camp. They give you great drips of knowledge in a, in a series of emails. So it's a great way to get started and kind of stay engaged. So they also um, do a, a ton of the work on the Akka documentation. So big thanks to them um, and uh, also a huge help in this presentation. Have to thank my company, Excella. Uh, Excella is a consulting firm in the DC area who allow me to come here and speak at events like these, um, which is fantastic. We have a training program, we do all sorts of consultancies, um, and I've been very pleased there for a few years now. So I couldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank them. And of course, our sponsors. Right? As, as a few people have mentioned in their talks this morning, without sponsors, it's hard to have speakers. Without speakers, it's hard to have a conference. Um, so we certainly appreciate all of their help. They, they're fantastic. A lot of great companies on this list. So if you see anybody from those companies, please engage with them today because they really are what's making this conference possible. That's me. I'm Sean. Um, I don't like to say too much about this, but my information is there. It'll be up at the end of the presentation. I'm a developer. I love developers. Let's do some development. So we're going to talk a little bit about why Akka.net and the actor model matters. Previously, when you think about how your code is built or how your applications are run, you may be uh, thinking about a classic you know, request response model. Right? Maybe you're making a request to a web server, you're, you're getting a response back, and scaling that up is a beast. It's really difficult to do, you hit all sorts of hurdles, um, and the bottom line is that takes time. Request and response takes time, and your customers are not willing to wait that long anymore. Right? It used to be that, okay, we could we can make a request, we could wait, um, our applications could go down, we'd have outage windows, um, things along that nature, right? We'd be able to uh, say, it's okay if this request takes a while, or we'll, uh, we'll just, you know, queue that up and we'll, we'll send you a message when it's done or something like that. And this is not acceptable anymore, right? Your customers expect real time. They expect things to not go down. They expect to be able to use your site at 2 a.m. on a Wednesday for some reason. Right? You need to be able to respond to that. And so along came the Reactive Manifesto. Right? A group of developers got together and they talked about how do we make you know, really good, well-performing, you know, high, um, high responsive systems that are fault tolerant. They started talking about the principles behind reactive systems and why they matter. So the baseline of the Reactive Manifesto is that we need to evolve with our users' expectations. So the Reactive Manifesto talks about how do we do that. So it defines what a reactive application is. So reactive applications by their nature, as defined by the manifesto, are applications that are responsive to user needs, right? They, they return requests quickly. 
They are resilient in the face of outages or deployments. They are elastic. You can scale them up. You can scale them out as needed, which also means you can scale them back down from a budget perspective, which is nice. And they are message driven. And we'll talk about all of these a little bit more in depth and you'll see some of these in the examples. But as a result of adhering to these principles, the reactive systems tend to have some great qualities. Right? They're flexible. You can build an application, build your code, and reuse it in many different ways, and we'll see some examples of that as well. They're loosely coupled. When you build a responsive application, you have many small components exchanging messages between each other. And those applications, therefore, are loosely coupled. You're able to move those individual components around and evolve them or change your architecture as necessary. They're scalable. If you all of a sudden need a lot more of a certain piece of code, you can get that. It's not quite, uh, not quite microservices. I know Don hates microservices, but it's not quite microservices. Um, but the idea is that you should be able to scale up and scale out these pieces of architecture as needed. They're going to be easier to change as a result of that. You're dealing with more single responsibility, more uh, finite units of work in your code, and you'll be able to understand how to evolve those pieces separately. They're also going to be fault tolerant. One of the things we're going to see today, and one of the, the primary benefits, I think, of a reactive system is that it's able to heal itself. You have the ability to recover from failure built right into the architecture of your application. So at every step of the way, your application is prepared for what to do if things go wrong, because we all know things go wrong. And so we're going to show a demo of that. We'll talk a little bit about that. But it's a huge feature of reactive applications that they are built from the ground up to survive no matter what you or the environment throws at them. And lastly, they're fast. Who doesn't love a fast application? Right? Fast is great. Faster is better. Fastness is best. Right, so a little bit of an overview of Akka.net. And the, and the actor model in general. Actors are not new. This is not a new concept. Um, I think Carl Hewitt put the white paper out for the actor model in 1973, where he discusses the, the, the mathematical proving or the mathematical implications behind the actor model. Um, it's a fascinating white paper. I'm sure I have not read it. <laughs> but, but I can tell you that it exists and that it exists long before, uh, long before Akka and Akka.net existed. So, uh, the, but the point is that this as a concept has been around for a long time. The idea of these discrete pieces of work that are communicating with each other via messages and that are part of a hierarchy for fault recovery. So it's been around for a while, right? So where the heck is this even used, right? It's been around for a while in the community, not so much in .NET. Um, actors are currently in use. Um, anyone familiar with, with Erlang, the language? A lot of actor model concepts finding their way into, into Erlang with the concept of the error kernel, which we'll talk about in a little bit. A lot of telecom stuff um, uses the actor model. Um, I believe recently Twitter and LinkedIn, I haven't checked re recently, but last I heard they both use some variation of the actor model. Uh, we've also got, uh, oh, uh, who here has heard of Orleans? So very, very similar, um, similar actor model, right? Similar library to Aqua.net in, in idea and usage. So that's powering Halo online. That's powering massive multiplayer online games. Um, we've also got, before I forget, oh, WhatsApp is using a lot of the actor model. And in general, any finance or data crunching systems that you're looking at or things that need to support fault tolerant streaming or high massive amounts of throughput are a great fit for the actor model in Aqua.net. So, how did Akka.net come around? Well, Akka.net is, is new to the, to the .NET world. Um, I guess a few years old at this point. Um, what was happening is, um, at least I'll, I'll retell Aaron's story worse than Aaron tells it, but uh, Aaron was, uh, was working on a company called Marked Up Analytics. And they were working on trying to figure out how to send messages to users once they had done a certain set number of events on the website. Um, so you know, they clicked over here, they looked at this page, that would trigger some sort of notification or an email or some sort of marketing campaign for that user. So they were doing this with HTTP and a SQL server. So the qu problem, you know, they, the way they assumed it would happen is request one would come in, the user has done something. You know, request two would come in, you track that the user did that. And then eventually enough of those things would be true, you'd fire off your, your marketing campaign. What happened is the, their SQL server just melted because messages were coming in out of order, Right? It's HTTP, you don't get to guarantee when a message comes in or how it's received. A message might be missed, a network blip might happen, and their entire application was sort of on fire. And he realized that he had sort of a, 
a, a, stateful, um, a stateful resilient processing problem. And when he Googled that, as he puts it, he found his way to the Akka project in Java. And his project was written in .NET. And so the way he tells it is he had two choices. He could rewrite his entire product in Java. He had a team of .NET developers who did not know Java. Or he could bring the Akka framework to the .NET world. So he spoke to the folks at the Akka project, who apparently are awesome. And they not only helped, uh, helped them get started, but they also let them use the name. So uh, you'll see a lot of similarities. They're built in a very similar structure. So that's how we get Akka.net. Um, Java's had Akka and the actor model for a while, and now we have it in .NET as well. So some concepts around the actor model. What does it mean? What does this actor model stuff mean? What are, what are the concepts behind it? So concept one is that everything is an actor in the actor model. How many folks here uh, program in some sort of object-oriented language? That is an awesome amount of fans, great. Um, so similarly in OOP, like everything is an object. You're probably working with some sort of you know, object or something that is derivative of an object. The same thing in the actor model. You know, everything's still an object, but there's sort of a, you inherit from receive actor, or you inherit from a type of actor. So everything in the actor system is an actor. And we'll talk about what the components are of a specific actor in a little bit. But that's important to note. Everything within your actor system is going to be an actor. It's going to have certain set components and expectations. It's going to be able to do certain things. And that is really important because keeping everything as an actor is how these actors communicate and how you can build up one of these resilient systems. So everything you work with within the actor model is an actor. An actor encapsulates one sort of set of behavior and functionality. So uh, if you have a certain responsibility, you might have an actor that is going to do the work of that responsibility. If that actor has additional work that it does, it may push that down into child actors, and so on and so forth. But in general, one actor is going to encapsulate some piece of responsibility. Immutable messages. Who's here, who here is familiar with the concept of immutability? All right, great. This is an important concept for Akka.net and the actor model. Immutable messages, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, are uh, the, the idea is that you're creating an object whose contents can then not be changed. You can read the properties, but you can't modify them. And that's important because in the actor model in Akka.net, you're going to have a bunch of messages flying around. But they're still just objects, and we want to make sure that you're not going to be able to change the properties of those in transit, and that you're not going to be able to do anything like that, because that can get into all sorts of havoc with some of the expectations that the system has. So you'll see in the examples in the code, whenever I, look, whenever I write messages, they're always going to be immutable. You can read the properties, but other than what you, pa you can't, you pass things into the constructor, and you can't change them after that point. If there's a list, it'll be a read-only list, for example. All right. Actors by reference is a huge concept in Akka.net and the actor model. The idea is that if you're working with an actor, you get a reference to that actor. It'll be an I actor ref, an, you know, an interface of I actor ref. And the reason is because you don't have to care where that actor lives. And we'll show a demo that, um, that it sort of makes it clear why that's an awesome thing. But you don't care if that actor lives in the same process lives in a different process, in a different EXE that's running alongside, or lives on a machine out there somewhere else on the cloud. You as a developer don't have to care about that. You will have a reference to the actor, you can tell it things, you can ask it things, and you don't have to care where that actor is instantiated and living. So you only work with an actor by reference. You don't work with an actor object directly. Uh, props are a concept in the actor model. Um, this props are the way that you create an actor. Think of it as the recipe for an actor. Um, so you, you pass those and rather than you know, saying new actor, you say props.create. And that's so that you can pass that recipe around and instantiate that actor in different processes or different systems. So we'll see that in action. I used to think this was uh, properties, like uh, you know, custom properties for your actor, but it's really just like a bad actor joke. Like actors use props, and so you pass an actor your props, and so it's not properties, it's just actors use props, and so this is sort of a, that's, that's, the, that's where that comes from. Um, everyone loves a terrible <laughs> acting pun. Um, so every actor has a few common things. Every actor object is going to have an address. It's going to exist somewhere within an actor system, and you'll be able to get there by referencing that address. It has a context. All actors live within a context of the actor system. 
So you may have your high level actors which exist within the system and you may have child actors that exist within the context of their parent actor. That's important when we talk in a little bit about actor hierarchies and how you can recover from faults and, and issues in the application. So every actor has the concept of supervision. Parent actors supervise their child actors. This is how we know what to do when things go wrong and how we can write strategies that are gonna tell us how to recover in the face of errors or exceptions um, or things that go on that way. Actors have a mailbox where they can receive messages and every actor has a specific life cycle that you can hook into. So when an actor restarts, it'll have a pre-restart method, it'll have a post-restart method, and you can hook into that to do certain things. And we'll show an example of that uh, when we demonstrate some recoverability. So every actor has all of this out of the box. Right? So those are all the concepts. If you're inheriting from any kind of actor, that's what you'll have. So a little bit about the actor addressing. So this is an actor address. So first up, we've got the protocol. I think TCP is still the default protocol for um, ACA.NET, but you don't have to use TCP. You can use a number of different protocols. I think you know, UDP for one. But there's uh, a number of different protocols, but TCP is still, still the default here. Next up is the name of the actor system. Every actor system is going to have one name. Right? You'll create one actor system in each instance of your application. But if you're running an actor system across multiple applications, they have to share that same name. So uh, if you're creating an elastic system and you're running it in 12 processes, when it creates the actor system, it has to have the same name. And that's how it'll know how to uh, allow those systems to talk to each other. That's a name that you'll specify. So you'll see this in our demos. Next up is the address of where that actor lives. Now in this case, it's localhost 8080. It could be some server out on the cloud. It could be you know, some other port on that same machine. But this is the machine uh, address of where that, uh, where that actor lives. And after this is the hierarchy within Akka.net of how to get to that actor. So what you see here first is there's a, uh, an actor here, or a place in the hierarchy called user. Akka.net comes with some hierarchies built in. It has a system hierarchy where it handles all of its business and how it keeps all of your actors running. And everything you do will be created under that root user actor. Right? And this is to make sure that even if all of your stuff blows up, the Akka.net system actors don't blow up. So underneath user, you can have an actor called hello world actor. So if I say system.actor of, and I give it a name of hello world actor, this will be the address. It will be under user dot you know, user hello world actor. And so this is to say that as you create these actors, you can reference them by typing in the entire address, though you certainly don't have to. But every actor will exist at some sort of an address like this. All right, we talked about the life cycle. So when we, when we have an actor and we need to restart that actor, we want to make sure we don't lose anything. Right? We want to make sure that we're still able to keep things processing um, and able to recover from uh, faults. So there are some, some things that we can do here um, to restart an actor or when an actor needs to recycle itself. So first off is when you tell an actor to restart, a method called pre-restart is going to be called on the old instance of the actor. You can hook into that, do certain things like, hey, I'm going to be restarted. Maybe I should save my messages so that they don't go away. Maybe I should tell something else that I'm restarting because that shouldn't really happen. You know, there are a lot of other actions that you might want to take uh, throughout the life cycle of this. After that, a new instance of the actor is created alongside Post restart is called on the new instance, and then at that point, the new instance replaces the old, and it resumes processing the messages. So these are not uh, the only lifecycle events that you, can, that you can hook into, but they are some of the most common ones. So the idea of context, right? We talked about context.actor. Um, every actor exists within a context. So if I'm creating a top level actor, like that hello world actor, I, I can only create it by saying system.actor of, and then passing in those properties. And that makes sure that the ACA system overall knows where that actor is in the hierarchy, can understand where that is, can, you know, it's part of the system at that point. If I just said new actor, ACA.NET has no idea where that actor is living in your system. Similarly, if I have a parent actor and I need to create a child actor underneath that, I will say context.actorof. Right? And that tells us that it's within the parent's context I'm creating a child actor. So this builds you a hierarchy of actors. Right? You either exist at, under that user reference or underneath some parent. And that's what sets us up for our fault tolerant uh, capabilities. So every actor has a context. 
So this sort of explains it a little better. This is one of Roger's great, uh, great illustrations. I did not do this one. Um, so what we have here is the idea of you have an actor reference, right? An actor ref or an I actor ref. That's going over some transport somewhere in the world. You don't have to care about it. And we'll see how that's awesome in a little bit. Those messages arrive at the actor's mailbox. It's an event-driven thread, and what that means is that you're not polling for messages. Some folks who have worked with, with queues or things like that know that you have to poll to get the messages. It's a little expensive, especially if you don't have any work um, to retrieve. And so these messages arrive and they're pushed into the actor. The actor processes one message at a time. So from your perspective, you don't have to worry about concurrency. You don't have to worry about using concurrent bag instead of list or concurrent dictionary. You don't have to worry about putting locks around things. Um, so it will come in and you have the understanding as a developer that it will process one message at a time. So those messages come into the mailbox and within there you have behavior. You can respond to that message however you want. You might send a message somewhere else. You might choose to modify the internal state of that actor. Um, you may choose to trigger some sort of supervision message or you might tell your children to do something, the child actors. You might send a message to them and asking them to do that. So the point is here that you have some sort of reference somewhere in the global area, somewhere within the vicinity of Earth, and it comes through here to the event-driven thread and is processed one at a time. So if you think about, the, the, the text here doesn't matter, it's very small, but it's just for demonstration. Um, if you think about a classic .NET system where you might have um, maybe uh, you have a service, maybe it calls some sort of business logic layer. Uh, from there, it may call a data <coughs> access object of some kind, then it may talk to the database. Right? So what happens when that call blows up? Right? You get some sort of an exception that bubbles up that you have to catch. Sometimes people do. Who here is perfect at catching exceptions? No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Um, and we see this in fun error messages all the time, all over the place. Um, if anyone's ever been plagued by a null reference exception, you totally understand what I mean here. So we have, we have exceptions that may or may not bubble up, and we have to do a lot of work to think about how we're going to capture those errors. Right? So Akka.net uses the error kernel pattern. Now this is, again, this comes from Erlang, um, I believe. Um, at least Erlang originated that, that idea, I think. Um, so the idea is that we do have this root actor here, and underneath that are our user and system hierarchies, and underneath user is all your stuff. And that's the hierarchy under which you will create things. So you'll have a, a large tree of actors underneath that. And the idea is that when that happens, you can apply supervisor patterns. And so within your parent actor, you say, I like to set up a supervisor pattern. And when any of my children blows up, you can choose a few things to do. You can say, I'd like to restart that child actor, and so it's gonna um, lose its internal state and then start again new. You can say, I'd like to ignore that error and resume processing, and it'll just take the next message. It'll keep its internal state. It'll do you know, uh, whatever it needs to do, and those messages will keep flowing. You can say, I'd like to stop that child actor. It'll kill it off, and then it won't be able to receive any more requests. Right? Or you can apply any number of custom solutions that you want. Those are the out-of-the-box patterns that you, can, that you have defined for you, that you can make use of. So the idea, there are two examples here. One is the one-for-one -one supervisor, and the idea is that you can specify a number of retries on a message, the number of retries um, within a certain amount of time frame that you can send, and what it will do is it, you will take an action. If this object blows up here, the parent will say, okay, I'd like to restart that actor. Right? And maybe it'll, once it restarts it, it'll try the message again, and it'll say, okay, if this thing blows up like 10 times in a row, I'm just going to stop it. Because there's no, no point in keeping it there if it's just going to keep erroring on every message. Or it'll restart it, or it may choose to escalate that error up to its parent. So at that point, you say, okay, the child has failed. I don't know what to do. It keeps failing. What's going on? And you escalate it up to the parent, which maybe knows how to restart all of these <coughs> or coordinate them in some way. So the point is, the more layers you have, the more chances you have to recover before you get to an exception that matters to your users. Before you get some sort of undesired behavior, you have a lot of chances to recover from that, and it's built in because you're thinking about that at development time. So similarly, the all-for-one supervisor says, okay, if one of my children um, has an exception, I'm gonna restart all of the children that I have. 
So not just that one actor, but maybe I know that they all work together. And if one goes down, I know I need to restart them all. So that's another out of the box pattern that you can apply, an all for one supervisor. So you have these strategies built in. You have the ability to think about them at development time, and that ensures that at runtime, you're gonna be a lot safer. So what are some of the benefits of this? Well, one of the benefits is async by default, right? All actor code is sort of async by default, but I mentioned that you don't have to worry about locks or concurrency because the framework is giving you the guarantee that any one actor is only processing one message at a time. So you just have to know how to receive that message and do whatever you're going to do in, as a result of it. So who here is good at writing great async code? No, you're not. No, you're not. And you will get bit by things all over the place and often do. Actually, probably a few in this room are probably good, great at async code, but I'm not. I'm certainly not. Um, and so one of the things I like about the actor model and thinking about things in this way is that it makes these applications easier to reason about. You're not spending your cycles in your brain thinking about how do we need to lock this? What is the, what is the threading model that I'm using? How, you know, what is happening behind the scenes? Am I, you know, am I closing the, over this correctly? Am I doing those things? You just have to think about how do I respond to this message? Framework handles the rest, which is what frameworks are good at. That's why we like them. So the framework handles those sort of aspects for you, which makes it really easy to reason about your code. Easier to reason about your code. Recoverability, we talked about that a bunch. Something goes wrong, you have a lot of chances to recover. You can pick up where you left off, you can make sure you don't lose any messages, you can make sure that you're able to you know, have a great experience for your users regardless of what happens behind the scenes. Actors are cheap, and this is not a dig at actors as people, um, but actors are, um, are incredibly cheap from a resource perspective. So actors use no CPU when they're not processing a message. They uh, use, um, I think you can fit at this point two and a half million actors into one gigabyte of RAM. So they're incredibly efficient and a low overhead. So that enables patterns like, maybe you want an actor for every entity in a certain table in your database, you can do that. Maybe you wanna model things in such a way where every user on your site currently has an actor dedicated to them that's doing some sort of management for that user. You can do that because the actors themselves are incredibly resilient and they're, uh, they're cheap to use. Also, uh, I wanna make sure I got my figure right, yes. Actors, um, the actor model aqua.net can process 50 million messages a second on a single machine. So you also have a ton of processing firepower there to handle that messages because you're processing lightweight messages, you're sending messages elsewhere, and the overhead of that is extremely low because they've done a lot of work to ensure that it is. Um, they actually wrote a benchmark tool specifically to help benchmark those things for the actor system, which is now in use in a lot of places. So, uh, it's nbench, it's not benchmark, I think it's nbench that does it. Um, so actors are cheap, you're gonna be able to use them without a huge impact on your system. So location transparency, we talked about only working with a reference of an actor, right? Location transparency is like a, similar to a cell phone. You just call a number, a phone rings somewhere else. There's a grid in between that that's doing stuff and routing and you don't ever have to care about it, right? You dial a number, someone's phone rings on the other end. It's right, so a very similar idea. I'm working with a reference. I can configure that behind the scenes. I can say, hey, this actor actually lives on this other machine. Or when you talk to this actor, you're really gonna talk to 20 actors in front of a router. And you can do that without changing your code at all. Also lets you do some easy state machines. There's the, object, there's the, um, the concept in Akka.net of become and unbecome. And we'll show a demo of that as well. Become and unbecome allows a an actor to change how it processes messages. So at runtime, if I'm processing a message and I get a certain kind of message, I can say become and switch to a different state, which will then handle incoming messages differently. So we'll show a demo of that. But if you wanna work on state machines or things that are sort of you know, starting and stopping uh, and not processing messages or are doing certain different things with messages, you can build that in as well. Configurability, I mentioned um, Akka.net uses Hocom, which is human-oriented configuration object notation. I think I got that right, don't check me. Um, but the idea is that it is JSON configuration um, on, on steroids, essentially, where you can have comments, there are different aspects of it, and it lives, in, uh, it lives inside of your app config. 
And so we'll show some examples of that and how you can show um, where certain actors live or how to configure them behind the scenes. But the point is that all the actors that you write are configurable via that configuration. So at runtime or at deployment time, your ops folks can say, you know what, we actually need like 30 more of those actors, so you're not gonna change your code, but I'm gonna add this line to, configuration, to the configuration file, and now there will be 30 actors. Right, so you can scale up and out just through configuration, which sounds sort of magical and creepy, but it, it's really neat when you see it in practice. So talking about single, you know, scaling, right? This is your 90s you know, CPU, right? You're using one core, you're not doing multi-threading, you're not using the task library, you're not doing async, all your code lives in this one little box. Doesn't matter how many cores you have, right? So you're, you're doing that, you're limited, I mean, these, are, these are the bad old days, right? This is before we had async await, this is before we had a lot of the, the, ta the TPL or other you know, task related libraries and threading. Buying a larger CPU, doesn't matter. Your code isn't going anywhere. So we get multi-threading. We get the TPL, we get async, we're able to take advantage of multiple threads, multiple cores on a CPU. Now you can build your app such that you're taking advantage of modern processing power. That's great. So however, then you need to scale out. What happens when you have to scale out? Okay, you've hit the limits of a machine. You can buy a bigger machine, you can buy a bigger machine, and companies often do this, and then eventually you hit a spot where you're like, okay, I need more than one machine. That's a bad time in a lot of development shops because all of a sudden you're introducing queues, you're introducing distributed concepts of one thing or another. You're not thinking about some of those guarantees. You're not thinking about how do we handle messaging from one machine to another. You get bit by network reliability issues all of the time. Right? All of these things uh, start to creep up and so what happens is as soon as you hit that point, it's like okay, let's stop and re-architect things. Not a great time if you're a dev shop that's trying to deliver, especially in what is usually the face of customer demand. Your customers want more, you've hit a wall, and then you say, okay, let's just step away and re-architect this thing. Bad, bad, bad time at the dev shop, right? So the thing about Alka.net is that scaling up and scaling out are the same thing. You write your code to process messages. You talk to other actors. You don't care where they live. So when it comes time to scale out, you actually have that built right in. You don't have to change your code. You may deploy some additional services somewhere else and, and configure Akka to talk to those things, but you don't actually have to change a line of code, which I think is awesome. You can, you can scale right out in the face of, of customer demand. But enough about that, let's go ahead and see if we can demo this process. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can switch so that I can see here as well. All right. All right, is everyone able to see this? I can zoom in more if not. Folks in the back, can you see it? All right, great. So here what we have is the, uh, I, I have a couple of demos here. The first one we'll do is your, your standard Hello World demo. So this is a console application and uh, right within the main uh, here we have, we're creating an actor system. This is something that you'll do once per process. Actor systems are expensive, actors are cheap, but you're gonna use one actor system generally. So I create my actor system and I call it hello world system. Then underneath I create a hello world actor, which I say system.actor of, so it lives in the system, in that overall actor system, and I pass in some props. Now this is telling me, uh, this is how you create a hello world actor. It's pretty easy, there's nothing in the constructor, you just create it. We'll show you that hello world actor in a second. And we give it a name, conveniently, hello world actor. Then I just do a, a, you know, a while loop, a infinite loop here. We say enter your name. We get the name from, from what the user enters. If someone types end, we'll send a finished message to, the, to our hello world actor. Otherwise, we will send the hello world message with the person's name to our hello world actor. So let's take a look at what that hello world actor actually does. So the hello world actor, the first thing we notice is that there's an actor ref here to a console writer, right? Our hello world actor makes use of another actor to write things to the console. So when we create the hello world actor, we say console writer context.actor of, and we create a new console writer actor. So that's now a child of the hello world actor. When the hello world actor receives a hello world message, I take in the message here, which gives me access to the contents, and I say, I tell the console, world, the console writer a new write something message. 
that says, hello, and it writes out your name. And I also tell it that it's being sent from myself. Self is a standard concept in any actor. You can say, this is myself. I can get my own path, or I can get my own name, things like that. If the hello world actor receives a finished message, we'll write it something different to the console writer. We'll say, I guess we're done here. Okay. So the console writer actor is responsible just for writing to the console. It receives a write something message, and it spits out the sender's path, so where that sender exists in the hierarchy, and whatever the message is that we pass in. So the message, we talked about immutable messages. The write something message for the console writer takes him a string of thing to write. It sets that, and then it's a, a read-only property. Right? So it can only be got. So let's go ahead and, and fire this up. This is my favorite part of any talk, is seeing if this works. Um, so no, we have a, I'm sorry, the text is a little small, but we'll see, we're entering a name. I'll enter my name. I'll enter my lovely wife's name. Um, and we see that what's happening is that a few things we notice. One is that that console writer is writing out hello and then the name, and we also see that it's coming from slash user slash hello world actor. That's where our actor is in the hierarchy. We also see that some things are happening out of order, right? This is all async, so it's writing to the console async. It's asking for enter your name, but then it's posting to the console as well. But we're still reading our console line here. So I'll go ahead, enter a few more names. Right? And then when we hit end, we see finished, press any key to exit. So we've sent messages to the actor. We're able to, to use multiple actors to get the job done. And that's your standard hello world actor experience. I'm next going to demonstrate uh, supervision. So we talked about actors uh, being able to recover in the face of failure. So here, for this demo, I have, again, I'm another console app. I'm creating an actor system. I'm creating a parent actor, and we'll look at these in a second. Passing in the props.create, parent actor. Also using a console writer, again. So, or I, I'm not using a console writer. I don't need that at all, actually. So <laughs> then I say for, uh, for 1 to 100, I'm going to tell the parent actor to process a number. And I'm going to pass that number along. So if we look at the parent actor, we see we have an I actor ref to its volatile child actor. And when we create the parent actor, it's going to create that child actor there. Um, I call it children because I used to do this with uh, multiple actors, but I actually don't need to for this demo. So uh, that could probably be called child. But at this point, when I receive process a number, I tell my volatile child to process that number. And I have a supervisor strategy here that tells us what to do if that child should fail. Now, for starters, I'm setting it to stop, so that child is just going to die off. There's a, there's a joke about Erlang developers like killing their children or loving killing children or something like that, so that's not, um, that's not me. I don't, I don't blame them for that. Um, so our volatile child actor here, we have the idea of a console writer. Now, rather than creating another child, since I know we're going to kill these off, I pass this a reference to that high-level console writer. So I'm not using a child anymore. I'm not creating a child. I'm using the address to refer to that console writer that's at the top of the hierarchy. So that's another way that you can get a reference to an actor is by using its address. Whenever the volatile child uh, receives the message to process a number, it's going to process it up until it's processed six numbers. And it's going to say, I already processed six numbers. I'm too tired to process whatever this number is. Right? Because this is a nice contrived demo. Um, and otherwise, it's going to process the number, it's going to tell the console writer something, and it's going to increase the number of, of, me of numbers that it's processed. All right, so let's go ahead and see what happens there with the default experience of stop. I'll scroll up when you see what happens here. So OK, so we see the parent actor, the child, is t saying I'm processing number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then it throws the exception. And at that point, what we see is that the uh, actor stops. One, the other rest of the 100 aren't processed. And two here, we see some errors from Akka that says message process a number was not delivered because the actor was stopped, so it couldn't receive a message. Akka helps you out by sending that message to what's called dead letters. So you can go ahead and recover from that. You can say, oh, if I've got a message from dead letters, check dead letters and see if I have any messages that I haven't processed, and then I can pick up where I left off. But in this case, we see that's clearly not great behavior. It didn't process 100 messages. Not, not so good there. So let's go ahead and change that supervision strategy from directive.stop 
to directive.resume. We'll see what happens. All right. Now here, we see one, all 100 numbers are processed. And what happens when we hit the, uh, there's an issue with the console coloring, by the way, so don't, uh, don't spend too much time on that. But uh, what we see here is that we throw the error, but rather than uh, stopping, we're not showing the error, and we're going ahead and processing the rest. However, um, those numbers, um, for example, pro number 21, is not still getting processed. It had an error, and the key is to keep the system functioning for the next message. By default, it's not retrying that message because it knows that that message did something bad. But it, what it is doing is keeping the system available for the next message to be processed. So this keeps its internal state. Similarly, if I wanted to restart the actor, change that to restart, that's pretty simple. Go ahead and we'll watch it go through. Now we see the errors happening, right? And rather than uh, just resuming where it was, Akka knows it's an error instead of a warning. It shows you the exception and it goes ahead and restarts those actors. Now, what that means, though, is that those messages still aren't being processed, those bad messages that, that caused us to blow up. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Well, Akka has the concept of a stash. Um, and what that means is that when I add I with unbounded stash to my actor here, I am then able to do some things with a stash. So I'll uncomment this code here. What we're gonna say is upon restarting, before we restart, I wanna stash whatever that message was. And it happens to know what the last message is that you received. So even though it's coming in here, you don't need to reference that. It will stash that message. And then after it's done restarting, it will unstash that message and replay it. Right, so now let's go ahead and see what happens there. All right, so we see those things fail. But for example here, we see 73, or we don't see that. Oh, the joy of demos, here we go. So even though 73 blew up and we saw it down here um, because we're writing to the console in an asynchronous fashion, it was reprocessed here at this point. So our console output is asynchronous, so it's showing out of order, but that actor was restarted and the message was then successfully processed. So this is great for thinking about transient failures or how to deal with them, and this is just one strategy that you can employ, but I wanted to show you that it's possible without too much um, finagling on, on your part. All right, so next up I wanna talk a little bit about routing so, and how we route actors. So I'm gonna to go to my routing demo here. Gonna to go to my routing demo here. Not gonna rename my routing demo. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna create an actor system called Elastic System. I have one actor that I'm creating at the top of my hierarchy called Demo Actor. That's convenient. It's gonna take a message called Start Demo. By the way, you don't have to put stuff in these classes. I just have a command called Start Demo. It's an empty class. You can pass that around as a message. So I'm gonna tell my Demo Actor to start the demo, and I'm just gonna kind of sit there and wait. All right, I'm, in my demo actor, I have two child references. I've got a reference to my random, uh, random number actor, which we'll talk about in a second, and a reference to my console writer actor. So first here, I'm gonna create a, my child actor, a random number after random time worker. <coughs> the goal of that is gonna be, it's gonna wait for a certain amount of time, and then it's gonna generate a random number, and it's gonna tell you what that number was and how long it took. So I create that random number actor, and also my console writer, I write out that the demo started. I probably should have used the console writer to do that. Um, and then what I do is I, I start my demo, and when I receive the start demo message, I tell the console writer that I'm starting, and then I use another feature of Akka.net, which is the scheduler. If you need to check heartbeats or you need to send a message every so often, this is a great way to do that. I'm telling Akka to schedule a, a tell. I'm gonna tell a certain actor a message repeatedly. I'm gonna start, I'm not gonna wait any time before I start. I'm gonna tell it a message every one second. I'm gonna tell the random number actor that message, and the message I'm gonna send is a new generate random number message. It's a command that tells the random number actor to generate that message. Right, so it's just gonna keep queuing up a message every second for that random number generator. Our random number generator actor here is gonna receive that message, generate random number message, it's gonna say, I've been told, once it receives that message, it's gonna say, I've been told to generate a number. 
It's gonna wait for a couple seconds between one and 10 seconds. It's gonna generate a random number and then it's gonna tell you what it generated. So the point here is to mimic some form of work. Something's happening, it's taking X amount of time. The amount of time it takes might be super annoying. So we're gonna see what we can do about that. So first off, we'll go ahead and go ahead and start that demo. So we see, we see, first of all, we see some output here. We see it's starting remoting, and this is Akka remoting, which is, so, tells you some stuff about the configuration and where it's listening. We'll get to that in a minute, so don't worry about that for now. But we see is generating numbers after eight seconds, three seconds, and it's waiting. And even though messages are getting queued up every one second, it's only processing one at a time. Well, that's boring. So we're gonna see what we can do about getting it to process more than one at a time. All right. So, in our demo actor here, rather than creating one r random number after a random time worker, we're gonna put that in front of a router. I'm gonna use a round robin pool. So, rather than creating one worker, I can say create this worker with a router, and it'll put a router in front of that worker. And then it'll create a new round robin pool with five child actors, and it'll send the messages in a round robin fashion. That's pretty awesome for one line of code that you're configuring an actor to deploy with. So now let's start this up, see if it goes a little bit faster. Can't start that because that's a class library, so there we go. All right, so now we see underneath, we see workers A, B, C, D, E. So we have those five workers that are being started here, and they're all processing numbers. So we're getting a lot more processing power right now. We've got five actors doing that workload for us. So we're still able to queue up those messages one per second in a round robin fashion, but we're getting a lot more of them processed. But I don't wanna to have to think about how many round robin pools or whatever I'm gonna create here. So instead, I'd rather get that from my config. So let's go ahead and look at, so now instead of the router from the red round robin pool, I'm gonna say, give me a router from my configuration. This is the configuration that got spat out at the beginning of that application. So I'm gonna comment out some lines here. I'm gonna say, oh, I can't do it that way. I'm going to remove those. I'm gonna keep this one commented for now. So now what we see is any actor that is created under demo actor slash workers, right? That's the address within our actor hierarchy. It's gonna use a round robin pool. It's gonna give me 25 instances because why the heck not? Right? So let's go ahead and start that demo one more time. John. Yes. Is that config in Hocon? That is a Hocon config, that's correct. So it's, it's inside of that there. But now we see 25 actors being created, receiving those messages and doing, doing the work for us. But that's not all. Um, one of the, one of the, but wait, yes. Um, so I have, this, I have this application here that I call blank slate. Now what you'll notice here is in blank slate, there's a little bit of configuration, and it says I'm gonna sit here on port 9001 on localhost, and I'm gonna use akka.remote. I'm gonna look at this program here. You'll note that it creates an actor system called blank slate, and it just says sitting here doing my thing. So if I run that program, it starts remoting, it's listening, it does nothing. There's no actors, there's no code in that program, it is just a console app that does nothing. It references a shared project here, which I call shared, that has some of the routing code in there and the actors and the messages. And so what we have here is we're going to go ahead and uncomment this line in our routing file here. We're gonna say, for these actors, use a remote and use the blank slate system at localhost port 9001. So I've got my configuration, I've got it there. I'm gonna go ahead and start this blank slate instance here. So again, no tricks up my sleeve, not doing anything, just sitting there doing its thing. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to start the routing app as well. What we should see here is starting the demo, but nothing's happening. It's because it's deployed all the other actors to that other console app that's running because all you need is a reference to that actor system. So now with one line of configuration, I've deployed my actor system to an entirely separate process. 
right? So you can start to get a lot of extensibility and flexibility from very little configuration and, and changes on your end. And note, I didn't change my code at all for that, right? No changes to my code necessary, except for saying, I'd like to take this from configuration. All right. So with that, I wanna say, um, this is only touching the surface. We showed how you can deploy to an, a different process or a different machine even. We showed how you can do that extensibility, scale up and scale out without changing your code. But there's even more. Akka comes with the idea, Akka.net has libraries for persistence, meaning what happens if the power plug gets pulled while my system's running? Akka.persistence uses a backend storage system that you select, SQL Server is a common one, persists your message there before processing that message. Then if the power goes out, you need to replay that message, you can do so, right? So you have that option. Also easy clustering, and by easy, I mean the easiest clustering I've ever seen. So still <laughs> reasonably, reasonably challenging, but it does, it has a, the ability to say, I would like this, these kind of actors to play a certain role and spin up a cluster of actors that know how to share workloads, talk to each other, automatically know how to gossip with each other and understand um, what's going on in your system. Right? Also streaming. Akka um, is really great for streaming events or streaming processing. So if you say, okay, well I have all these actors, but what do I do when I get so many messages? How do I figure out how to not overload my system? Akka has the ability to use Akka streams so that you can automatically back off on your message processing. Say when your CPU hits 80% or something along those lines. So you can use that as well. And I'm barely getting to touch on the surface of that here. So we've got persistence, clustering, streaming. Um, if you want more, there's a lot more over at getaka.net. You've got the docs there, um, and certainly I'm around, but definitely check out Petabridge for that boot camp um, and the aka.net GitHub project. One of my favorite things about it is that it's a great open source community. I was actually, for a while, like the top eighth contributor to aka.net, purely because I like helped them edit a bunch of text files. It was no programming at all. But the, <laughs> but the, but the point is that they're very responsive. They're very helpful. Um, it's a great group there. So I encourage you, if you're looking to get involved with open source, as I hope you are, it's a great place to start your journey there as well. Um, so uh, my, my link here to the presentation and the, and the demos are all, all available there. Um, contact information is here. And thank you for your time.